We're four friends with hot takes on food media. And we're here to review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. Plus, virtual potlucks, cooking adventures, and food memes. Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Hi, I'm Amanda. Hey, it's Justine. Hi, it's LJ. And it's me, Meg. Welcome to another episode of Pod Appetit. In this episode, we're continuing our coverage of the 2018 Netflix series, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, hosted by chef and food writer Samin Nasrat. The show is based on Samin's James Beard award-winning book of the same name and follows Samin as she travels around the world to explore the basic elements of good cooking. On the menu for today's episode, we have Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, Episode 3, Acid. To illustrate the transformative powers of acid, Samin visits Yucatan, where sour oranges, salsas, and Mayan honey add new dimensions to every dish. Yay, Mexico! (laughs) I'm so happy! (laughs) So exciting. Yeah. But before we get into acid, we're going to find out what we've been cooking and eating. Amanda, what have you been up to? Um, not cooking again. Sorry, guys. But I got to eat takeout from my favorite Indian restaurant because it's open again. Oh, yay. yay. What did you what get? What did you get? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got some special... Need to know. <laughs> I got some special chicken tikka masala and some garlic naan. I also got what they called a mango shake. It's not the same as like, I would think of like a traditional American milkshake kind of thing. Oh, is it a lassi? A lassi? Not quite a lassi. It's like, I feel like it's a bridge between the two, mm. but it was very delicious and mango-y. And I Yum. made the mistake of getting spice level four and I should oh. not have done that. And I still have leftovers because <laughs> I can only eat so much at a time before I'm like crying from the heat, but so happy. <laughs> <laughs> spicy spicy girl yeah so yeah next time i will get a three instead of a four but it was oh so delicious and so nice to eat from ob again it was so lovely <laughs> amanda's like blissed out in the corner now oh. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about indian food um yeah i um i actually haven't done an awful lot of cooking um in the last couple of weeks because being pregnant it's hard <laughs> It's hard for me to stand in the kitchen and over the heat a lot because I get tired and swollen and sore um, and like lifting things out Excuses. of cupboards. I know, it's <laughs> terrible. So Russ has been doing more of the kind of uh, like dinner cooking, which is when we normally cook. Um, but I have been um, baking. So Bake Off started, as I'm sure many people are aware, or what do you guys call it? The Great British Baking Show. I have decided to try and cook something along the theme of each week if I can each week so the first week I did a cake so I made a honey cake which was a Nigella recipe uh weirdly enough it has no honey in it (laughs) it's made with golden Mm. syrup but it tastes delicious and you make like this butterscotch sauce to go over the top of it so I have loads of that sauce left Mm. over which is also very good on ice cream I should recommend and then I also this week was uh, biscuit week or cookie week as you would probably call it in America <laughs> not biscuits <laughs> as in the you know <laughs> dairy what, what? Well, how would you describe American biscuits? Flaky biscuits. Flaky, delicious, savory biscuits. No, cookies. So I made Rick Martinez's brown butter and toffee chocolate chip cookies um, because I've never made them mm-hmm. and he's always posting them on his Instagram from when people have made them and tagged them in it. In it. So um, I was like, I'm going to give those a go. And they were delicious i had one just before we started recording so they've gone down a storm in the house and they've only been alive for about two hours so (laughs) (laughs) let's see um so yeah that's what i've been up to so we can expect a bread lion from you during bread week yeah bread week is next week (laughs) um bread bicycle i haven't (laughs) decided what to make yet but yeah a bread lion is pretty up there um in terms of an option yes (laughs) How about you, Justine? You guys, I made a pesto. Oh, yay! But what? <laughs> I made a, a new pesto. Oh. <laughs> I made a carrot top uh, pesto. I've heard of this. What do carrot oh. tops taste like? It's very 
herby and um i would say it was most similar to the parsley pesto i made mm. before but not as bright not as like over the top mm. flavorful but there is like that earthiness to it um so yeah it was carrot tops like two cups a bunch a cup of basil to balance it out and i use pistachios as Ooh. my nuts fat sort of chunkiness to it which i like using pistachios in pestos and yeah that olive oil salt really easy peasy you know pretty healthy ish yeah. probably <laughs> i mean yeah i think so when you said you made carrot top pesto I forgot the carrots of tops, and I thought you were saying it was a recipe from the comedian Carrot Top. Oh, I was man. like, I didn't know he was into cooking. And then as you explained it, I was like, Amanda, you're an idiot. It's the actual tops of carrots. No. Sometimes they're called carrot greens. Yeah, yep. yeah. I feel like we need a pesto stinger for every time you make pesto. <laughs> hey, pesto. Hey, pesto. Yeah. So what is this, like my fifth or sixth different type of pesto you I've made in a year? You make a lot year? of pestos, um, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to stop you from making more. Like, don't don't let anyone stop you. <laughs> Keep going. Aww. Live your pesto dreams, Justine. Yeah. I will. Um, yeah, and I also made something a bit spoopy. Ooh, yes, I saw this on Instagram and it made me so happy. <laughs> yeah, um, I was roasting, I was going to roast sweet potatoes and I saw on Pinterest that you can just cut them up into little jack-o'-lantern faces <laughs> first. So what you do, yeah, you do little uh, slices that are like a quarter inch thick and then just carve a little face. It's a little pain in the butt, but that's so cute. So so that cute. is like adorable. They're so cute. I just have to do it. It's October. And I loved your caption because you were like, I'm vegan, so I don't eat anything with a face unless I've made it myself. <laughs> it really made me laugh. I stab it into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was so it's funny. cool it's cool nothing weird here no okay go on meg what did you do <laughs> oh boy so i made the miso cured eggs that they showed in the salt episode of salt yeah Fat you Acid did Eat. of course you did <laughs> <laughs> of course i did i'm so predictable so i guess i'll have to choose a different recipe when we do our potluck episode <laughs> but they were really easy to make just hard boiled some eggs and then wrapped them in miso. I happen to have white miso instead of red miso, which is what Samin used in the episode. So if you're not familiar with the different types of miso, it's not white, white. It's more like a light tannish color mm. and red miso isn't really all that red either. It's more like from light to dark on the scale of miso colors. So I think it turned out really well. The eggs did not take on as much color as we saw in the episode because yeah. the miso I used was a lot lighter than the miso Samin used. And also the recipe says to remove the miso after it's been curing for four hours and then you can either eat it then or eat it later. So I actually let it cure for about five hours, removed mm. the miso, and then I ate it the next day. And when I first removed the miso, the color was a lot darker. But then by the next day, it had sort of diffused into the white of the mm. egg, I guess. So it was much, much lighter. But I really liked it. The flavor was very miso. I wasn't sure how much of the flavor the egg would take on, but it absorbed a lot. So wow. it has, yeah, it was really good. It had just a strong miso flavor on a hard boiled egg. That sounds it, delicious. It was tasty. I'd make yeah. it again. That yeah. sounds so good. I would love that. And I think if it's that, do you have to use quite a lot of miso to get it around each egg? Like you do have to use a lot, but as the recipe says, you can save it and use it again later. So oh. that's what I've done. I scraped it off and put it in its own little baggie. And I think it might just be my egg curing miso <laughs> mm -hmm. or Did i'll like use it. it for soup but yeah it does say specifically in the recipe that you can reuse the that's miso. good to know because that was my main worry because i was yeah. like that seems like quite a lot of miso for like just it eggs. is a lot yeah but if you can reuse it that's that's put my mind at ease thank you <laughs> <laughs> for yeah. sure. all right so speaking of salt fat acid heat let's get into it episode three acid acid 
general thoughts on this episode before we go blow by blow? My only disappointment in this episode was that there was no drinking of vinegar because I was really f- looking forward to like a vinegar tasting in the way she did with oh. like the soy sauce and the <laughs> the uh, olive oil and the others. Like all week I've been like, yes, somebody's going to drink vinegar because I might do that sometimes because I love vinegar so much. And then it didn't happen. But I, other than that, I'm fine. <laughs> what kind of vinegar do you just like straight up hit? <laughs> um, I may have had some malt vinegar earlier this week. I mean, it was like I also was using it in something. But I've done it with apple cider vinegar, balsamic vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is like good for you health wise. and Yes. Stuff too. Yeah. Drinking, you can get drinking vinegars as well that are like designed to drink. Mm-hmm. They're just not quite as um, sour, I guess. So they're easier to drink, but they're a bit like kombucha, I think. Mm-hmm. Russ likes those. Um, but yeah, I was um, not disappointed about the vinegar. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I, I'm not as obsessed with vinegar, clearly, as, as um, Amanda is. But I was really happy. I didn't know because I haven't read ahead. I've tried to keep it as a surprise. I was really happy to see that she goes to Mexico in this episode because I have to say when I was thinking of like acid and what country might represent or be a good place to go and represent kind of what acid does to food Mexico was one of the ones that came to my mind so I was really happy um, to see her go there and I've never been but I've always wanted to so I really loved the kind of travelogue in Mexico so really happy about that Speaking of travel logs in Mexico, everyone should be watching Rick Martinez's Instagram stories. Oh, yes. They're gorgeous. If you want to feel like you're living in Mexico, follow Rick Martinez. Because he is. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to feel like you're living in Mexico and you're remodeling your beautiful house. <laughs> yes. And cooking beautiful food every day. <laughs> every day. How does he have time? I'm just, well, I guess it's his job, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Amanda, so it didn't fulfill the vinegar drinking for you, but you did get to see her try all those different citruses in the citrus market yes. and pucker up a lot. And the honeys. I oh, I mean, I yes. know we're not necessarily there yet, but like the, the different, all the different citruses and the honeys. I really liked this episode a lot. I mean, no, there was no vinegar, but there were so many other acids and things and taste tests that it was fun to see. So were there any foods in this episode that you guys found surprising in their acidity? You know what I notice is that cheese has been in every episode so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cheese, true. Cheese is like the magic ingredient for food. That's why it's so yeah. good. Yeah, that's has, why I was like, this is why everything. people love cheese. This is why they call it like the wonder food because yeah. it hits all it hits points. It's, no, I noticed that as well. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a rocklet, you just have all the elements. You're all done. All the elements. Exactly. Melted cheese is the king of foods. Like, what else is that? <laughs> <laughs> I fully agree on this statement. Um. <laughs> I did think that it was interesting that when they were in the citrus market at the beginning, um, they were tasting all the citruses and the um, la abuela explained that in Mexican cuisine, they don't really use vinegar. They always use the sour oranges for that sourness and that acid hit instead. Mm-hmm. And I was, I just have never really thought about that before, but it, Obviously, it's true in Mexican cuisine, you know, lime juice, citrus juice is in everything. Like, it just Mm -hmm. gets sprinkled everywhere. Mm -hmm. And actually, it does play that role. I guess I'd never really thought about the two being an equivalent type of food, but they definitely are. I mean, they're both acidic. I wasn't surprised by any of the foods that they listed as acidic and I'll tell you for why I think I would have been if I'd watched this a year ago but these um days being pregnant again it's um (laughs) I have been suffering with such bad heartburn and it's really bad when I eat foods that are acidic and I didn't Mm. know until I suffered with this issue that honey is acidic so and I only found that out because I quite often eat like oatmeal with honey in the mornings and it's been giving me such bad heartburn and I can't do it anymore and it's because honey is acidic and I didn't know that before I just assumed honey was just sweet but it's it's really not (laughs) (laughs) yeah I don't know if I would have described honey as tart before watching this episode but it makes sense yeah I think the other thing that surprised me was the chocolate the acidity of the chocolate yeah but I mean like it is until like we add pounds full of sugar to it and milk yeah Yeah. right that makes sense 
proper dark bitter chocolate is what they mean um it's not yeah. like you know dairy milk <laughs> right yeah it just i think i'm so used to chocolate being milk chocolate you know like that i was like oh yeah that makes sense if she's literally just making it herself from the beans and like it yeah it just it wasn't something i had thought of on that level i guess mm-hmm. 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 Mm. it's like coffee yeah no yeah coffee's acidic definitely definitely <laughs> <laughs> all right so should we get into it yes mm-hmm. yeah So this episode starts in Yucatan. I guess the whole episode does, but they go to a citrus market. And Samin is joined by Dona Conchi, la abuela. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) What did we think of the citrus market? Gorgeous. Oh, so Made me jealous. I really want to go to a citrus market. (laughs) I didn't even know there were such things. Uh, It's delightful. Like, so colorful and interesting. I... Maybe I missed it, but did they bring their own salt or was the salt provided by the stalls <laughs> to put on the citrus? Because I was like, is she just walking around? Was provided. Provided. <laughs> they were just walking around with salt in their pockets. Um, no, I, I, don't know it was. I mean, fine. I'm not going to judge. Uh, I mean, but... if anyone does, it's probably Samin, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But I thought that was super interesting. And again, the first hint we got of them pulling all of the strands of the this series together where she was saying, oh, you put salt on the citrus to tame the acidity in it which i had that was a tip that they kept mentioning throughout this episode and i have literally never thought about that before that if you get something that's super sour add salt and that can that can knock it back and i was like oh my god this is like mind-blowing i'm so happy that i know the answer to this now um and then they were saying but you know you can put chili on it which enhances the flavor and i guess that's kind Mm -hmm. of like a bit of a heat type element as well so just showing you how you, they combine all of those elements to get a taste that's like in the in the good spot uh, in terms of a flavor profile. I just thought that was super interesting. Yeah, I think salt and chili is a real go-to in a lot of Mexican snacks in particular, and especially with things like fresh fruit. I really liked seeing just all the different types of produce here. So we had pineapple, mm. mandarin oranges, passion fruit, sweet lemons, gooseberries, mm. sour oranges, all sorts of stuff stuff i've never heard of sour oranges <laughs> yeah there was so much talk of sour oranges and i asked myself have i knowingly had sour orange i don't know if i, I don't have. think we get them over here that's the one i've said this before when i was making the rick's um rick's gonna get a lot of mentions in this episode uh making his pozole <laughs> mexican ingredients like proper authentic mexican ingredients are so hard to find in this country so that's why i'm always fascinated by mexican cuisine because uh I can't mm-hmm. do it <laughs> very easily. <laughs> Out of like the two things at the citrus market that I really wanted to try myself was the sour orange and the sweet lemon. I don't know, just the because I love lemon, love, 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 love lemon. And <laughs> can you guys tell me like you acids are all apparently? about acid? <laughs> yeah, Fair, yeah. yeah, acid queen. Mm-hmm. She be tripping. <laughs> <laughs> And so I just, I don't know, just like seeing her reaction to the tasting of both of those, I was like, oh my God, I want to try them so bad. Are there any languages Samin doesn't know? Besides Japanese, yeah, I so guess. Many. Right? <laughs> I was like, how does she not get confused? Doesn't she speak like nine languages? <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, I get, tr- in, like in Europe, I always have trouble remember like especially if you're traveling through europe so going from country to country it's like oh which country am i in now like accidentally speak spanish in italy and like whoa you know it's difficult it's difficult to remember but she she's she's good (laughs) she's like google translate (laughs) (laughs) any thoughts on the pavo and escabiche the turkey with the meatballs meatballs. and they were some big Mm -hmm. old balls right (laughs) <laughs> i know do those count as meatballs at that point it was like a little meatloaf yeah i was gonna say that's not a tiny ball <laughs> no not tiny ball they did look like i don't know what the color was when they were done yeah it was like, a, it, was like it had been poached right in the broth yeah mm-hmm. um, and that egg in the middle I'd, i would never think to put an egg in the middle of a meatloaf a meatloaf meat ball because <laughs> it was just like a head of meat wasn't it it just came out it was like the size of your fist yeah <laughs> i mean i love a good meatball like a like a big meatball but that was like it wasn't a ball anymore it was like an amoeba like... <laughs> a meatba um yeah <laughs> 
a two nuclei amoeba with those two egg yolks in there yes i thought yeah. it was interesting though because they they didn't it wasn't like when they were plating up yes you put like a little bit of everything on your plate but then you didn't eat it like a dish you put it in with in the little tacos right in the little tortillas and eat it Mm -hmm. that way so you're not supposed to eat it like a you know carve into that meatball and eat it that way you're meant to kind of break it up with all the different bits and pieces and then you know sprinkle some lime on it or something and eat it as a little taco no it reminded me of like when you get like indian food it's like a little bit of things with rice you know yeah yeah no more thoughts on the turkey, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Turkey's not my favorite meat. I think it probably tasted amazing. Mm-hmm. It's not the way I would think to cook a meatball. I'm sure it tasted great. Samin seemed to enjoy them. She did. Yeah. She totally did. It looked like comfort food. Good home cooking comfort food. Yeah. Uh, one thing I did learn from this segment was definitely how if you're going to use acid to pickle something or marinate something it's really fast acting you can't keep it in there for too long without Mm -hmm. it going too far and like i guess overcooking it in a sense because acid does sort of a light cook essentially that's the whole concept behind Mm ceviche so like for 10 minutes it would be nice and tender but if you leave it in there for hours the meat's gonna be too tough so i thought that was really interesting to learn because i didn't Mm -hmm. i had never really thought about that before so i guess if you're doing a marinade that is very acid heavy you have to be aware of that otherwise it could all go horribly wrong. I I am not an acid person. <laughs> Being from the cold north originally. <laughs> and also like some acids like hurt my stomach. Like I can't have like orange juice in the morning. I'm like, oh, it's too acidic, you know. Mm-hmm. I do like it as a garnish Mm -hmm. though and to like cut through something i think when she told that story a bit later in the episode about that thanksgiving that she had she felt like she had to put cranberry sauce on everything because there was nothing to kind of cut through all the heaviness and the starchiness and the fattiness of everything the richness of everything and the cranberry sauce really did that job for her she's right it does cut through stuff it does balance out a dish really well if when you use it in the right ways um and i think it's a good element to learn how to use so that it it can have that power and cut through and balance the dish out but i'm like you justine i couldn't i can't just drink acid (laughs) on its own (laughs) are you telling me you can't just drink vinegar (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) even before i had heartburn i couldn't do that (laughs) i think that was one of the points of the thanksgiving story too is that acid is good in moderation as garnish like you said so Mm. too much acid is definitely not good you just want a little bit of punch on the side she also mentioned like serving lime with pho or having white yes. wine and risotto. So yeah, if you have a glass of orange juice, it's just pure acid. So yeah. it makes a lot of sense to me that you would just want a touch of acid, a little bit yeah, to like brighten Yeah, like pickles a on a burger. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're Amanda, obviously, and then just drink acid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just interesting because there are certain acidic foods, like hearing you say that you know, we mentioned coffee. I love coffee, but I can't drink coffee anymore because it does upset my stomach. Right. And ever since I was a little girl, I can't eat tomato-based sauces for the most part because oh. they make me sick because I they upset my mm-hmm. stomach. And me as a child eating pizza was a very bad idea for anybody at a child's birthday party. I can't tell you how many <laughs> times my mom got calls like, so Amanda threw up and she's like, did you feed her pizza? Yeah. But she's fine now. Yeah. Yeah. Don't feed her pizza again. Like that was, that was like my mom's like that was every sleepover you went to. Like just don't feed her pizza. Wow. So I am like very sensitive to certain acids, but then others like, I don't know, like I can eat lemons and limes and I love orange juice. Like, I don't know. That's how I really like to get my vitamin C is just like having a couple glasses of orange juice. So it's weird. I don't know. I am an anomaly. <laughs> I feel like by the end of this series, we're each going to have our own like Captain Planet element, right? <laughs> so yes. Amanda's acid. I would say I'm salt. I don't know. What about you guys? <laughs> I, I, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, I'm fat and um, LJ is heat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently. Apparently so. There you go. 
By our powers combined. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, what's the thing? It's like, save the environment. It's the perfectly balanced dish. <laughs> A perfectly balanced podcast. <laughs> okay. um, do you think that has anything to do, I know I'm skipping ahead a little, but that reminded me of the pH scale that she was talking about. Yeah. About like where it falls on the pH scale. I I was really glad she showed that because that was a thing that we did when I was like growing up. We did this whole thing where we had to do the pH strips and test different things. The litmus test. Yeah. 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 And I remember being fascinated by the fact that milk ended up technically falling in as an acid instead of an alkali. It's funny, isn't it? Because you wouldn't, some things you expect to be one or the other are not what you think so yeah it is interesting yeah especially when that's something like if you have something too spicy it's supposed to cut it but then it ends up like i don't know it just yeah all of that i i was like instantly like 11 and like doing little like experiments again i'm just thinking like it's funny that you can eat like tomatoes are a problem but you can drink vinegar (laughs) i I don't know it's but it's true and like the vinegar actually for the most part like counteracts my heartburn it's yeah that's funny but also you have to remember as well so people always think oh no acid is the stuff that like burns and is really like you know um dangerous if you get something that's too acidic but alkaline if you go the other way something's too alkaline you can definitely have bad effects from that as well so you know it's like a mm-hmm. it's almost like That's a circle true. like they both burn <laughs> at a certain <laughs> point if you get too high or too low all right well next we're going to talk about salsa and tortillas and a whole lot more but before that let's take a quick break for some ads all right we're back let's talk about salsa Samin ate a bunch of salsa with Rodrigo, the salsa lover. In Mexico, no salsa, no meal. (laughs) (laughs) I really liked this segment because it reminded me of Hot Ones going from the (laughs) least spicy to the spiciest. Totally. But it also looks so fun. Like, I was like, this is why I want to go to Mexico. I want to go to, like, a food truck and just sit and eat different tacos and different salsas and just have a delightful time with a beer. Like, how much fun. I just really loved it. Oh, absolutely. This made me really long for a cold beer with a slice of lime and a street taco. (laughs) Sounds so good. And again, Rodrigo was like, oh, if it's too spicy, put salt on it. And that helps it. I'm definitely trying that next time I have something. That's what you should do with your curry, Amanda. Just put salt in it and you'll be oh. fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll try and I'll report back to you and let you know how it goes. But what if it just makes it more curry and just intensifies the spice? Oh my God, this is so confusing. <laughs> I also thought this segment was quite interesting because Samin pointed out that actually the basic building blocks of what they were eating, like the plain corn taco and the meat were quite plain. And it was just the salsa and the garnishes they were adding on top that brightened the whole thing up and gave everything that depth of flavor. And I really saw the parallel there between that and what was going on in Japan when they were talking about how Japanese cuisine is often just, you know, really, really minimally prepared like protein and then the plain rice like not even seasoned and then again all the garnishes and the sauces or whatever that go on top is what gives it the di- and I was like ah oh, same same but different <laughs> <laughs> yeah you just need a plain ish vehicle to bring you the really flavorful stuff <laughs> yeah that actually segues kind of well into the next segment was when they were talking about corn tortillas and the mm-hmm. masa and the technique of i'm not gonna be able to say this correctly nixtamalization yeah (laughs) Yeah. i just kept thinking of like nixomatosis which is not the same thing (laughs) (laughs) so as samin said in this segment the tortilla and like you were saying it's such a good counterbalance to salsas and meats because it gives you this nice soft flavor i think she said it was a steady flavor i believe was the word she used so you just have this very reliable kind of one note i would say in a good way tortilla that then can complement and balance everything else i love corn tortillas <laughs> me too <laughs> and that lady Donya asaria is that her name um mm-hmm. makes 250 a day by hand 
a day. <laughs> I just in awe, like this amazing old lady just and like literally with her hands, not with a press. No, right. Yeah. And that community mill that she showed them. I loved that. I was like, that, that was my great. heart. Yeah. Like, oh, look at them all, like milling their corn and then going back and making their tortillas. I was like, oh, that's that's how life should be like in, in your community. Is that what you want to do all day? Yes, all day? I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what did Sola say in the first episode of Stump Sola? How she just assumed that they had community ovens going in the 18th century yeah. Yeah. but she said oh, this nice. because she didn't know how to start a fire on her own and she's like yeah i just got this flame from somewhere else <laughs> from that community oven i'm sure they had yeah, the yeah. i'm flame. sure they did i love it no i thought i thought that was delightful and i really enjoyed this segment even though it technically wasn't an acid segment but um i thought it mm. I well, thought it was fine i was happy to be there she brought up the acid though that she said anything that has fermentation you bring in that acid element by doing the fermentation to like the corn before they take it to the mill and then it made me think like okay so then when they were making miso in the last episode for salt but then it has to ferment for three years or whatever like so it's also having like becoming acid in that time and then we already talked about like the cheese has like the salt fat and acid it just it felt like triple threat Everything was building there. And I just thought that was really interesting. And I, I mean, I think of like pickles, obviously, as like an acid, like when it's in a brine and things like that. But I'd never thought of like a tortilla being that because of what is done to the corn before it is milled and then made into the, I I don't know. I just found it really interesting to kind of see all the different layers. It is interesting. All right, the next segment was my favorite segment. This was of the yes. Melipona honey. <laughs> bees! The bees! I know, and that's literally what I've written on my notes. It's gone bees! <laughs> me too, me too, me too, me too. <laughs> so cute. And I love the way they talked about the bees as well. Like how me they too. have like a really close oh. bond with them and there's no need for any wearing any protection gear and I was like you guys love the bees and the bees love you this is amazing (laughs) it was so sweet Um, literally no pun intended I usually intend my puns but I did not mean that one but it's really like they were stewards of the honeybees and how they were explaining the bees must be protect protect the bees (laughs) bee defenders (laughs) Yeah, how they put up Meg, the canal Meg. to stop the ants. What? <laughs> we gotta mention that you love bees so much. Okay, yeah, I just make this sense. So I am a, I'm an aspiring beekeeper and also, yes. a, and also kind of a beekeeper. <laughs> so yeah. for the last few years, I've been trying to keep mason bees, which are solitary bees. So that means they don't live in hives like these bees do or like honey bees do. And they also don't create honey, but it's a good sort of, I guess, starter bee (laughs) for people like me because they also like these melipona (laughs) bees are stingless. So they're a very gentle bee. They're very easy to care for. But the the sort of unfortunate part is that they only live for a couple of weeks in the spring. So I really only get to try this experiment once a year and hope it works. <laughs> so basically <laughs> I get these bee cocoons and make this nice little house for them. And the goal is that I hope that they'll return and lay their eggs there. And then during the fall and winter, I would then care for those eggs and then release them for protect. the following spring. Protect but the bees. <laughs> I know. I'm a bee protector, <laughs> bee defender. <laughs> Uh, but unfortunately, I've released cocoons and none have returned yet to oh. lay their eggs in the nice little house I made for them. But next year, fingers crossed, I yeah. have a new plan. Yeah. Oh my God. Meg's bee stories on Instagram. <laughs> I love the bee stories. <laughs> I live for the bee stories. Um, Meg, I didn't know this, even though I'm a, a, a bee fan, probably not a very knowledgeable one, clearly. Um, but ants kill bees? They do. They get in the hive and eat the larva. <gasps> no. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. There's <laughs> goddamn ants. I don't. Be- I can't. Because I. I just was like, really. I didn't know that. Oh my goodness. Well, we need to look after them. Yeah. So this was really interesting to see their technique here in this episode. Is that they made canals of water to stop the bees. And I know that in other techniques for beekeeping, like commercial honey beekeeping, usually the hive is raised 
above the ground so mm-hmm. that the ant can't get to it and usually there's just sort of like sticky tape you know kind of like fly <gasps> tape that they put oh. on the legs of the hive and then the ants can't reach the hive he's got their ants mm. um, but also they have those plants that get rid of the negative <gasps> yes, vibes because the bees vibes. are sensitive I love it <laughs> <laughs> that's what you need to do meg plant plant some plants to get rid of the negative oh, okay. vibes that's what you're missing right specifically you know that i'll try that i'm gonna put some reeds <laughs> over my mason bee house and it'll just it'll get all the bad vibes away there all the bad gg that's right we do get to see this family that's been doing these techniques that have been handed down for generations mm-hmm. right and amanda how you were comparing the miso and the masa how you felt that they were sort of yeah. similar this really reminded me of the soy sauce part of the salt episode oh, yeah we have these yeah. generations of families using the same techniques that have been handed down and yeah. the olive oil guys too. Mm-hmm. But in this case, we've got little tiny bees instead of little tiny microorganisms. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And do you think they also work harder if you watch them? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Cheer them on. <laughs> I was really blown away by, um, similar to Samin, how clear the honey was that they were extracting, mm-hmm. but also how small the yield is and how runny it mm-hmm. was. Because, like, honey mm-hmm. that I buy in the store in the farmer's market or wherever I get it I try and get it in the farmer's market where I can because I like getting like local honey but it's so viscous like this was like juice they were just sloshing it around in a bottle yeah and also what we learned in this episode was that honey is not just one thing no and oh man that taste test was like incredible yeah she described one as buttery and another one she said, oh, I would have sworn there was lemon in there. She said it wow. was like lemonade. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I want to do that. Have you guys ever done like honey taste testing where you taste different honeys from like different regions or honey that's made with different flowers? I've done it at the farmer's market before at the honey stall there because they usually have the little taste of- so you could decide which one you want to buy. Um, that's fun. But yeah, you could definitely tell based on what the bees have been eating and like what flowers are available to them. Mm-hmm. There's definitely differences in taste. It's really interesting. Yeah. Different flavor profiles. I just, mm. I every time I travel somewhere, my husband and I always get honey from that region. Like that's oh. one of the things that we always do. So that's a good idea. I, I clearly acid really is my episode, guys. I was not <laughs> yes. expecting this. <laughs> it really is. Um, but yeah, we've been doing that for years ever since we first started dating. Whenever we go to a different region or in the U.S., um, even if it's just like a different part of Ohio, we try to get honey from that area um, because they all have they all taste a little bit different. Mm. Trader Joe's has a great honey sampler around the holidays that has a bunch of different honeys from different flora so they've got like a clover honey and an orange blossom honey really tasty and i think some just straight up flavored honeys in there as well but you can tell the slight difference based on what the bees diet was So the next segment in the episode starts out in the Merida market and we meet Regina, who is Samin's chef friend. And they make, oh my gosh, pronunciation, Tikin Zik. Of course I get the episode where I don't know how to pronounce anything, (laughs) unlike the salt episode. (laughs) And they also make pavlova together. I loved how they were explaining, or Regina was explaining, sorry, that in Mexico, because she's been trained in France, right? So she's she's French trained chef as well. Um, but she was like, yeah, in Mexico, we don't really care how you cut your vegetables as long as it tastes good. And I thought that was so funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you won't go to kitchen hell if you cut your vegetables wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, there's definitely something to be said for that, for sure. <laughs> absolutely i thought the dish that they made with the yeah i don't know how to pronounce it either but fish and banana leaves basically is what it is um Mm -hmm. loved that i really enjoyed watching them make that the ricardo rojo the kind of spice mix that they made for the fish Mm -hmm. um i just thought that sounded absolutely delicious and then with the vegetables on top and the i had never really considered that banana leaves impart a flavor i just assumed it was what people used to cook because they you know from the days when they didn't have like foil (laughs) do you know what i mean but i guess i guess it does you know give give some kind of 
it adds something to the dish cooking it that way which is why people still do it i've never heard of the fish they were using before either cousin no me either i tried to look it up and i tried to listen to what they were saying the name of it was and rewound a couple times but i still didn't quite get it (laughs) i wish this section was longer yeah i love this section and the dessert the pavlova the way they were putting that dessert together was just so beautiful it just looks so pretty i wanted to eat that so badly i love meringue i love how they described its crispiness yet it's very marshmallowy on the inside those looked like the perfect meringues such good meringues and i don't know where she got them from or whether she made them herself or what but it was amazing how they were like you could literally just scoop your finger and it was like marshmallow yeah amazing but the fact that i don't think i've ever had a pavlova normally i have it with berries like berry type fruit um i don't think Mm -hmm. i've ever had it with Mm -hmm. citrus fruit but i could imagine that and like as a like a uh, a really awesome summery like twist on the dish and then with a the little bitter chocolate grated over the top and the honey like I just was mm-hmm. like oh this is this is pavlova but like another level like so good mm-hmm. I'll be honest I had heard of pavlova but I didn't know what it was until watching this episode so obviously I've never had it surely you've seen it on Great British Bake Off yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably have but I haven't watched as many seasons as you guys have so I'll have to mm. keep an eye out as what you mean every season (laughs) (laughs) i'm still i still have like three to catch up on i don't know i was just so fascinated by it and like the all of the different like flavors together it reminded me of i don't know if this is anywhere else but in in the midwest there's this thing called ambrosia salad Mm -hmm. which has kind of you know not meringues (laughs) i don't know if you can call mini marshmallows and cool whip (laughs) equivalent (laughs) but like the ambrosia like my i don't know that we always had it like family reunions always had like it always had googling ambrosia salad and i've got to say i'm mildly horrified (laughs) (laughs) oh god oh i forgot to mention the salad meal that we had earlier this week where um carlos brought home salads for everybody but it was like a super midwest because we had actual salads and then we had we had tuna salad chicken salad two kinds of potato salad uh two kinds Mm -hmm, of pasta uh salad no taco salad salad (laughs) there was all kinds of stuff so ambrosia salad is like dessert salad is that what you're trying to tell me yeah it's not really a salad at all it's like whipped cream and um some of them sometimes they have marshmallows and then it always had like oranges and like grapefruit and like other citrus and i just as i was watching this pavlova i was like oh this is what it's supposed to be and then ambrosia (laughs) salad is what midwest was like this is what we're doing guys (laughs) When the Midwest gets their hands on Pavlova. I wish the listeners could see LJ's face. She is horrified. I I just, I, I, it's a concept I've never come across before. And I would be quite happy if I never came across it again. I'll stick with Pavlova. Yeah. I don't know. I will say ambrosia salad. It's pretty good if you like whipped cream and marshmallows. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh dear oh my goodness yeah i think yeah pavlov is great you should try that <laughs> <Men see. laughs> yeah yeah i'll try that instead going back briefly to the fish and banana leaves dish i know i was saying before that it was like oh yeah acid's great if you just have a little bit but this dish really is all acid all the time pretty much so like you were saying, it's got the achiotto anato red paste, which they said was very acidic. It has the tomatoes, and they charred a lot of stuff, which they said can impart acidity as well. Mm. So this dish definitely seemed like acid, all the things. Mm. Except for the fish. I'm sure the fish was not very acidic. <laughs> but it takes it on. Mm-hmm. And of course, they got to eat it together family style. This really harkens yeah. back to the fat episode and to a lesser extent to the Japanese salt episode. It's really nice to see this community family meal together. Although they, they brought out a soup for an appetizer. And I was like, where was that? I want to know how they made that soup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As a soup yeah. fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, where did that come from? Did they did they cut that for time? I don't know. Um, but I would love to know how they made that. But yeah, I thought the fish 
being served and it was served with all the salsas and the tacos and like you could just make your own kind of little uh, mouthfuls just looked so cute and i also loved the it's actually a recent technique that i can't believe i haven't learned sooner but the bow to the taco technique <laughs> where you the taco <laughs> stays still and i think i seem to remember didn't the alex eats everything on the menu uh series mm-hmm. that they used to do at BA um didn't they di- when they went to that taco place in New York didn't they talk about that with Rick where it was like you, the they taco did. stays yeah. still mm-hmm. and then you yeah I've I've, I've practiced yeah. that since and it does work it's much better than doing it the other way <laughs> <laughs> see so much to learn from Rick this is our honorary Rick <laughs> oh, episode yeah, yeah. That's some content we need. Samin and Rick hanging out. Oh, I'd love that. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> That'd be great. So once again, I would say this episode didn't really tie together how all the elements work. We did mention that there was salt in the market. Regina mentioned salt and how it complements acidity. But there really wasn't too much mention of fat here. She did Man, say, you no know, fat. that acidity cuts through fat but that was on a long list of other types of flavors that acid can balance out so yeah it doesn't look like everything's being tied together yet no it's interesting isn't it i will say i was so happy to see the family family meal thing go back to the italy kind of format Mm -hmm. um and it just makes me even more annoyed about the salt episode and the way they handled that and i i actually i'm i'm kind of got the sinking feeling that our suspicions were kind of right in that episode that it was to try and westernize the cuisine to make it a bit more Mm -hmm. palatable and that just really i'm not into that at all because i'm like mexican cuisine is also difficult to cook if you don't know what you're doing as is italian and so i don't see why japan should be treated any different so i don't i didn't get that at all but agreed yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i had that same thought and i was like damn it because I was I like, know. oh, I, this is so nice that it's back to that. And the format from like the fat episode. And then I was like, but this is getting <laughs> yeah. short shrift to Japan. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree with you, Meg. There's no thread tying yet. And I really would want that. I want, I want the threads to be tied. <laughs> i can't just have salt fat and acid flapping in the breeze they need to come together (laughs) all right i think that's gonna do it for our discussion of acid now it's time to find out what we've got cooking on the back burner so the back burner is the segment of the show where we briefly talk about anything weird funny or just plain entertaining going on in the food world so today we are so happy to talk about a new youtube series called stump sola you may remember sola el whaley from the food network that shall not be named <laughs> and to our great delight she has now joined the babish culinary universe Yay! so stump sola <laughs> Oh, yeah. Sorry. Pause for celebration. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag solidarity. Yeah. So Stump Sola is a 10 episode show airing on Saturdays. We thought we were going to get an episode yesterday at time of recording, but that didn't happen. Ah, it remains to be seen. But so in the show, Sola spins a big game show style wheel and has to put her skills and experience to the test in a twisted cooking challenge. So far, we've seen her have to make mac and cheese using only 18th century cooking methods and create a seven course tasting menu, primarily with ingredients from a bodega. Yes. (laughs) I'm liking it. (laughs) I'm liking this a lot, too. It's so good. It's a It's a really good show, and I think if anybody is missing that little, you know, hit that they used to get from before, in the before times, (laughs) this is where it's at. It was so before times. Like, so much has happened since then. I love that she's partnered with Babish as well. I was subscribed when he was binging, um, when he was binging with Babish, not just when he was yeah. <laughs> Which that is now a series on yes. that yeah. channel. It is, yeah. And I just think it's great that he is expanding and I think he's given some hints that there will be more people joining him in the universe um, other than Sola. So I'm really excited to see where that channel goes. And yes, I couldn't be happier for Sola. This is exactly what I wanted for those members of the Test Kitchen who... Wanted to continue doing video, but couldn't do it 
at BA. So this is exactly what she mm-hmm. she needs and others need that feel that they want to continue doing it. So yeah, really, really pleased. I love the concepts as well of this show too. The concepts so are fun. really fun. Yeah. So fun. Yeah. You can tell he's having fun with her too. Like their, mm-hmm. their chemistry together. But it's also so yeah. good for Soda in particularly knowing in particular knowing what we know about her she's so knowledgeable she's got such a like Mm -hmm. depth of experience that you could this is exactly like the right thing to do with her to just be like ah let's see if we can put her knowledge to the test and you know she's 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 exactly the right person for it so i'm really really pleased yeah i definitely think you see a lot of that knowledge more in the in the second episode the seven course tasting Mm -hmm. menu because she gets to go all wild out she uses so (laughs) many types of equipment she just tries every technique that you know we've never heard of and she's just like limitless (laughs) limitless <laughs> yeah limitless. i could have watched twice as long of an episode on that as we did it was so interesting mm-hmm. to see her thought process and mm-hmm. how creative she was and just taking chances and i was gonna ask you guys do you feel like there's like the it, it just seems like soul is a little more free in this it just seems like she is able to just kind of relax more if that makes sense i feel like the feeling that we got from like watching ba videos in the end especially like gourmet makes is that they were like here are the statistics that we need to hit we need to do this in every episode because this is like what we get back that and we know that they produce their shows in accordance to data you know not what the host wanted to do but it was very con- constrained that mm-hmm. way. And I feel like with this new show, first of all, with a, when a new show develops, you're like, okay, we could do anything, so let's try it all. But then also, yeah, I agree with you that like she doesn't have that extra burden of like those particular network people or producers mm-hmm. who may have tr- been trying to put her in a box. She did seem very happy to me in these videos, and I don't know if that's projecting too much or reading too much into it, but I did kind of get the feeling that, oh, yay, she's in a platform where she is valued, and, you know, I'm sure it helps to know that you're being compensated fairly in the way that you deserve. That probably translates to a happier on-screen presence, I would assume. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. But I also loved seeing her creativity, more of her personality, I think, also. She truly is is a mad food scientist and I love it. She's just so bonkers, her ideas. And then it's really hard to guess or anticipate what she's going to do, which I just absolutely love. And she's so experimental in that Carbonara Three Ways episode. Yes. That truly was the tip of the iceberg. And I'm so glad that we get to have a show centered on her experimenting with food i really feel like that was like that's her segment of that show was like the pilot for babish being like i could do something better (laughs) with just soda (laughs) yeah i think so Mm -hmm. because her mind will go places and it will blow us all away (laughs) in the convenience store tasting menu what little uh tasting course would you want to try from her all of her experiments (laughs) The reconstructed Twinkie. Yes. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> but most of all, I wanted all of the chicken cookware. That was so cute. Oh, uh-huh. it was adorable. <laughs> I think they were just like actual set pieces and she was probably like, can I use this? Can I use, I'm yeah, sure you can use, I use this. all of the chicken serving dishes? <laughs> <laughs> why not? That's, that's like Sola's attitude. She's always like, why not? Why not? Mm-hmm. Let's, Let's do go it. for it. Let's try it. It's good no, for no, her. She's a positive gift. role model. <laughs> yeah. So one last thing on the back burner. We wanted to mention that a new season of The Great British Bake Off has started. So there mm-hmm. have been two episodes released as of recording. And of course, we are loving it. Yeah. Trying to avoid those spoilers midweek is hard. <laughs> yeah i'm sorry because i watch it every tuesday and i'm like oh my god you guys and then i have to wait till friday to talk to you about it (laughs) (laughs) yeah lj gets it a few days before we do over here in the states definitely want to make a cake of a famous person now yeah that first episode (laughs) very memorable (laughs) hilarious i don't think i've laughed so hard at an episode and we got the drama of pineapple upside down gate (laughs) (laughs) 2020 (laughs) 
let's move on to shouting out some of you wonderful listeners <laughs> who Woo! have been so kind as to get in touch with us. So we're in that really fortunate position where so many people have reached out to us with nice comments and feedbacks that we simply can't thank everyone by name on the podcast. But just know that if we don't mention you here, we do read everything you say, and hopefully we've responded to you online. We really, really appreciate it. And first, we want to shout out Shubra, who sent us an incredibly heartfelt message, and we just wanted to say thank you here on the podcast. We're so grateful that you reached out, and we're really blown away whenever someone shares how we've positively affected their lives. It's really kind of mind-boggling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sending lots of hugs. It blew Absolutely. my mind. We love you. We got some feedback on our salt episode. Mrs. Casper shared her fancy soy sauce, and she also had Nancy Hachisu's book, so she was super prepared for that episode. (laughs) Thanks also to Heidi from Vibrant Visionaries. Reformed Bandits shared that they are currently on a low-sodium diet, so they didn't watch the salt episode, (laughs) but they promised to tune in for acid, so we hope that you are listening now, Reformed (laughs) Bandits, and we hope you enjoyed it. A lot of people answered our question about what kind of salt they have in their kitchens. Thanks to Paul, Kali, Polina, Dan, and the Edmonton Tourist. The Edmonton Tourist also shared what she had been cooking. And you guys, she had been making vanilla bourbon extract and pumpkin bourbon bread, oh. which sounds amazing. Wow. LJ not drinking, reaches for water. Yeah. <laughs> The artisan gemologist and share food on Instagram also shared what they were cooking with us. The Varmints podcast posted a pic of their terrifying mandolin and asked everyone to share (laughs) the scariest thing in their kitchens. So that was pretty fun. I like Amanda's answer. I am the most terrifying thing in my kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) I think listeners would agree. (laughs) And finally, y'all have a lot of opinions on how to take your coffee and whether (laughs) cheesecake is a pie or a cake. So thank you to Art History for All, Les Represent Podcast, Spooky Marv, Conceal My Hands, Kathy, Margaret, Michael, Christy, Abdul Aziz, Leslie, Sunny, Jen, Rachel, Gemma, Katie, Nessie, Marie, Nicole, Melissa, Chris, Deegan, Allison, and TJ. Just some of the people who weighed in on those topics. We love you. We love you. Wow. I feel like that should be set to music or something. Just like a little (laughs) tune. Like like Mom by Number Five. (laughs) I I was thinking like Yakko's Countries of the World. Oh, yes, yes. (laughs) 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 Exactly. So now we'd like to share a review but we don't have one to share. <laughs> Man, when you set it up made me like be like, ooh, but I know we didn't have any. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so yeah, if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll read it out here and personally thank you. And just as a reminder, we have changed our name, so you can find us by searching for Pod Appetite Gourmet Takes. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Be sure to join us next time for Heat, episode four of Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Heat. That's my sizzle. (laughs) Sorry. By our cooking powers combined. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We'd love to hear from you. So find us on Twitter and Instagram at pod underscore appetite. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitepodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitepodcast.com. Oh, hey, it's Brett. And Brie from your new favorite podcast, Particularly Dangerous Situation. PDS, babes. With climate change continuing, it's best to know what to do when the next disaster strikes. Be prepared to hear about event after event of intense destruction. Mother Earth and climate change are in the ring, and we're watching the fight. As well as people making dire planning mistakes. Join us every week as we each discuss a disaster that sucked us into the research rabbit hole. Available wherever you listen to podcasts, Particularly Dangerous Situation. Situation.